Hello, everybody. Uh, I welcome everybody tonight. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday, and I'm very impressed that you're going to come out the Monday after. I'm sorry for the delay. We had a little snafu. We were locked out, so we were scrambling to get ourselves set up really quickly. So again, I apologize for the late delay. Um, and we're very, uh, this is going to be our last um, meeting of the year. Uh, and I'm really ex uh, pleased and impressed at not only the people that have turned out from the community, but also the response we have gotten from the Hampton Bay's Water Department. We have James Warner here who's going to give a, a little presentation, Assistant Superintendent, about um, you know the Water District. And then I'm going to have to look down because we were s we, we've been just so in, uh, lucky to have the number of people from the DEC come. So not only do we have Nicole Hart, who will talk a little bit about what's going on at the remediation efforts at Chinnacock Canal, uh, we also have um, and I'm going to probably kill the pronunciation, but Brian Jankowskis, who's DEC project manager, uh, and, and also John Swarthout, uh, who's a professional engineer, and Steve Karpinski, who's another project manager. And then we're very lucky to have John Collins here, who I gather works very closely with uh, the, not only our water department, but his company, H2M is I, nationally known. They've done a lot of consulting, um, both in the architect architectural and engineering areas, uh, both for public and private sector in the water resource area. Um, then we have, a, we have a couple of other major things um, to discuss. Uh, at the end of the meeting, we're going to uh, go over and hopefully get your input on what you'd like to see as agenda issues next year. Uh, so we really would like your input at the latter part of the meeting for that. We're going to, at our last meeting, um, we had uh, our nominations chair, who couldn't make it here tonight, Bonnie Doyle, presented a slate of the, for the board for re-election, uh, which, which was accepted and it was closed. There were no nominations from the floor. So we've, we're very, very uh, lucky to have Supervisor Jay Schneiderman here, who is going to swear in everyone. Uh, for the new board. So if uh, at this point, if we could, oh, and another thing that I should have mentioned, again, uh, we have two trustees here, uh, uh, Ed Warner Jr. and Scott Horowitz, and they're going to give us some good news about the, uh, about I believe finally the commencement of the rehab on the old Ponquag Bridge. So we have a lot of, you know, wonderful Oh, yes, yes, we have a trustee elect here, we have a board we have a town board elect here. Uh, and I really appreciate your being here, Tommy John Scavani. And uh, I'm sorry, the trustee elect is? Oh, I didn't see you in the back. How wonderful. <laughs> OK, then what we'll do is we'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. And then I'm going to have uh, the nominations assistant chair come up. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United Nations and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, with liberty and justice for all. OK, now uh, I'm going to ask if Bob Rickey could come up. He is the uh, assistant chair for the nominating committee. Thank you, Madam President. Following is a slate to be sworn in when your name is called. Uh, please come where, Madam President? Here, there. Uh, we'll ask Charles. Is this right in front? Right in front. Right in front, please. Janice Landis, president. Maria Holtz, vice president. Rebecca Redden, treasurer. Bonnie Doyle, secretary. Bonnie's absent this evening. Scott Bolster. John Capone. Ken Deneu. Liz Hook. Mary Pazin. And Jackie Russo.
Uh, it's working. Good evening, everybody. So I've been uh, asked or given the honor of swearing everybody in. This is uh, the 99th year of this organization. So next year, it's going to celebrate the 100th birthday. I think that the Hampton Bay Civic Association is the oldest civic association on Long Island. I could be wrong, but that's what I've been told. Um, and 100 years ago, uh, it wasn't called the Hampton Bay Civic. It was called, I guess, the Good Ground Civic Association because it wasn't until 1922 that Hampton Bays became good, uh, good, good ground became Hampton Bays. So, um, so I'll ask you first uh, to raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to uphold the Constitution and bylaws of the Hampton Bays Civic Association and to support its mission statement in effect since 1918, namely to promote the prosperity, welfare, and civic advancement of the community of Hampton Bays by united effort and action in every possible lawful manner? If so, say, I do. Do you further promise to perform to the best of your ability the duties of the office to which you have been elected? If so, say, I do. On behalf of the membership of the Hampton Bay Civic Association, I want to thank you and wish you every blessing in your dedication to the association and to the community of Hampton Bays. Congratulations. I'm just going to uh, go a little bit out of order on the agenda. The, I'm going to ask the trustees if they would to just come up and they're going to fill us in a little bit on the uh, plans, hopefully, for the old Ponquag Bridge. So this is uh, Ed Warner Jr., who is the president of the trustees, and Scott Horowitz, uh, secretary treasurer. Okay. Well, it was a little over four years ago uh, when Scott was walking uh, the town hall and uh, Anna Thornholtz uh, called him in and asked him about the Pongquok Bridge project and Scott called me up and we met with her. At that point it was a total demolition. They were going to tear down the bridge, lose all the habitat, all the diving and everything that is there would be gone. But Scott and I quickly jumped on the bandwagon and uh, you know s put the boat in the right direction, basically saved the bridge and saved the habitat. So four years later uh, a couple of redesigns and uh, it's going to be uh, starting on the 18th of December. Chesterfield Associates, a local contractor, is going to be doing the project. A very good contractor. I've worked with them on the trustees on a few projects. So I think it's a great, great you know, place to go fishing and watch sunsets and uh, the habitat and everything's going to be preserved. Um, one thing that's going to happen, the, uh, some of the bridge access and the uh, diving access is going to be taken away uh, probably for about nine months. That's the time frame for the project to be done. At that point, we'll have a nice fishing pier. The Ed Warner Senior Park will be up and running again, and everybody in the local community can go down there fishing and enjoy it. So, I'd like to also ask you all to give yourselves a round of applause here because it was uh, the hard work of also the Hampton Bay Civic Association that helped us get our points across in taking it from a total demolition to actually being a, a good point of public access for people to fish and just enjoy the water, bird watch. It's a great diving destination. Uh, and there are millions of filtering bivalves there, cleaning water every day. And that has all been saved as well. So it's just a classic example of where a group of people were able to get together and really get a good project to go. Uh, my hat's also off to the, uh, to the town board, the deputy supervisor, the town's chief uh, engineer, Christine Fenton. Uh, there was a lot of people that jumped in that helped get this all to go in the right direction. It was a heavy lift. It took four years, uh, but it's going to be a great thing for Hampton Bays and a great thing uh, for the people of the town of Southampton. So December 18th is the kickoff date. Hopefully we'll start to see barges. Uh, there's going to be a lot of activity going on under, underneath the bridge. Obviously, we're going to be collaring up some, uh, some pilings there, and um, we're going to do the best we can at uh, getting this done and keeping it on track. Hopefully the weather cooperates. So thank you very much. Thank you all.
Thank you so much. And I think it's a long time coming, and we're re all really happy about it. Now, uh, what the format for tonight, we're going to we want a lot of questions um, from you all. So we have, I, hopefully, there are index cards all around on the chairs, and there's more at the tables. Uh, Maria and I are, go Maria Holtz, the vice president, and I are going to walk around and we'll collect the cards and ask your questions, and she's waving them as we speak. Uh, James Warner. Assistant Superintendent Hampton Bay's Water District, which sort of give an overview of the Water District. Then you can ask whatever topics you want in, within that, per, uh, you know, about the water uh, issues in the community. We know that a couple of them that people are interested in uh, are the, the were the higher levels of the PFOAs on several of the wells. So we have the people from the DEC here to address p particular questions about that. And as I said, we have Nicole Hart here who will talk about the remediation going on at the CPI canal property. And hopefully, you know, whatever questions you have between the combination of our guests tonight, we'll be able to answer them or at least get on the pathway to get the answers. So with that, uh, James Warner, right here. Okay. Well. <laughs> And yes, I'm sorry, and John Collins too, who I gather is probably intrinsically involved in this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I understand you guys got some questions for us. You want to start with questions for us? Do you like an update? Well, uh, in front of us here, uh, basically what we're working on for two carbon filters for the main plant, one plant one, where we have the uh, PFOS, and the wells are not on right now because in the wintertime they're shut off completely. You have to hold it up to your It's on. Here. The wells are shut off completely for the wintertime, and hopefully we're, we're shooting for the springtime to have our uh, filtration in place so we can use that well field as well. But that will only be a seasonal well field. We're only going to use that for the summertime if, as needed. But the water come as it goes through the filter will be completely cleaned of any problems or uh, chemicals that we have to worry about as far as PFAS or gasoline or anything like that. Uh, early last year in March, uh, the EPA had a standard of PFAS in the water at 2, uh, 200 parts per trillion. Uh, at that point, we had no detect in the wells, and it came back overnight from two, 200 parts per trillion to 50 parts per trillion. At that point, when we did our samples, we had one well that was over. That was immediately shut off voluntarily by us. We went to the town board and told them what we had to detect and what the, the EPA had done. And then... Uh, this spring when we did our samples again, we found out the, uh, that yet another well was getting close to being over for detect, and uh, that was only used on a uh, last run basis. It was be the last one on and the first one to shut off when we needed it, and for fire flow. So what we came up with is we didn't use, we shut, basically shut those two wells off, one last year and one this year, and now we've gone to the town board and explained the whole situation, and we've uh, contacted our engineers and we're uh, uh, going to bid on carbon filters for that plant. And all the other well fields have been tested for it since then, and we have nothing, nothing more to say about it. We have nothing in those well fields. So everything is good except for the three at the main plant. Um, from, I think to just sort of elaborate on it, from what uh, general understanding is that there were three well fields. There's a third one, right, that's used for firefighting? The, the wells, uh, one dash uh, three was only to come on at night uh, as needed mm -hmm. for fire flow. It was uh, basically only on for a couple hours a night, and it was, m it was well, it was uh, mixing with all the other well fields, which uh, allowed us to be able to use it, because they had no detect in any of the other wells, and which would mean the water uh, chemical for detect would be way lower than uh, uh, standard. Now, could you talk a little bit about um, the water water flow at the CPI canal, uh, CPI property? From what I understand, 
there, uh, in general, there were um, problems during the summertime about uh, pressure and water availability on to residents on the uh, east side of the canal, and there was concern uh, about that being maintained, the, you know, the regular water flow being maintained, and also with the advent of the townhouses that are proposed, that are uh, projected to be built on the east side, we, there was an understanding that I think there was supposed to be more connections made and more water availability, potentially, I think, with the uh, uh, hooking into the Suffolk County community system. Yeah, uh, you want to hit that one, John? <coughs> uh, shh, this is good. Um, yes, there um, there definitely were some probably some pressure issues on that side this year because they had lost two wells at their one field here on Pongquag Avenue. Uh, without those two wells, they had trouble maintaining the peak peak demands. Um, either way, though, uh, from what I understand, it is um, although pressures were low, the pressures were maintained. Um, there was an analysis done on that property, and it recommended, I think, up to four different options that the um, town slash water district could do to keep adequate flow and pressure on that side of the canal. Um, ultimately, the choice was to upgrade the interconnections with Suffolk County Water on, Baconic, on Montauk Highway at Baconic Avenue, um, and that would help them maintain the peak fire flow demand that they need. Has that been affected? Has, well, has there been agreement made and has that been put into effect? Uh, the agreement right now is with Suffolk County. Is we've met with them. They have agreed to do it. Um, yeah, they've well. yeah, there's an agreement between Hampton Bays and Suffolk County. Um, nothing formal, actually. It's uh, All it is is in um, verbal right now. Okay, someone asked, what can be done about all the iron in the water? Using a chemical cause called uh, the uh, uh, orthopolyphosphate. Orthopolyphosphate. It sequesters the iron coming out of the uh, raw water. Um, it's not 100% effective uh, always. Sometimes the district is forced to use wells that have more iron than others, especially in the summertime when there's more pe more people, more people watering their lawns, uh, more demand. Uh, so they have to turn on wells that may have a little bit more iron on it than they want. Hello. I'm going to take over from Janice sure. for a minute, um, give her a break. Um, so my, I'm Mary Paisan. Mm -hmm. I have some other questions, which I gave them advance notice of. I want my paper back. Um, but some of the questions from the audience. Um, do you know what the source of the um, the uh, PFOAs in the you know what where the source was for the PFOAs? I think they're still investigating that. The DEC might be able to comment more on that. And how? Um, so you you guys don't know where the source is. We're not we're not sure until the we, DEC. We can't point a finger at anybody right now without more information. Okay. Um, okay. So, how do people know? if they were drinking from the contaminated wells? Or is there a way that you can say that, you know, the water from X, these wells goes to this neighborhood and water from other wells goes to other streets? Uh, it, there's no set way you can say a, a one well from plant one services a certain um, area. Uh, they could do... I, what I can say is that the water from the wells that were affected um, was blended down, so anything even leaving the plant was uh, non-detectable. Uh, but there's no definitive way to say that well 1-2 is servicing a house on whatever street, Main Street or Elm Street or Ma Maple Street, just to throw some generic names out there. Mm -hmm. And the parts per million that the federal government established last year were was it seven, 70 parts per trillion? Or 70 parts per trillion. And our wells tested at, if I recall, 72 and 79? Is that correct? Yes. yes. 72 and 79, yes. Okay, so slightly above. Mm -hmm. the, um, the carbon filters, um, somebody had asked whether the carbon filters are the only technical solution. 
No, there's yeah. other there's other treatment options. There's uh, uh, <clears throat> something called ion exchange. There's uh, RO or reverse osmosis uh, um, blending. Uh, we did a report and we found that the most economical, the easiest to get online, and the most true and solid was going to be granular activated carbon. Are there maintenance costs associated with that? You have to change filters, right, on a regular basis? The carbon has to be changed out every two years, about. Are carbon filters going to be installed on all the wells? Not at this time, no. And will those wells be put back into service for drinking water after the carbon installation is done? Yes. Okay. Um, on the um, on the CPI, and I, I think this might also be a question at some point for um, uh, uh, DEC, but as you guys probably know, there were some leaking fuel tanks at the site. So were you aware of those leaking fuel t tanks? And I feel like I'm doing it. <laughs> Senator, were you, are you aware of those leaking fuel tanks? No, we were um, not aware of that at all. Um, you were not no. So I mean, no, is, it, is, it in, no. is it is it is uh, it is it possible that anything that leaked from those tanks got into any of the drinking water? Uh, likely no. The groundwater in that area flows towards the canal, um, so there are no wells between CPI, the old CPI, and the canal or any of the bays. The fuel tanks. Yes. Right. So it was probably not anything leaked into the into the water. We have that. The status of the agreement with Suffolk County Water, uh, Janice mentioned. Just We're so folks know that this was uh, the supplemental EIS for the Canoe Place. Ian said that the um, applicant had to study the water flow across um, the canal, mostly for firefighting purposes, I believe. And the solution that um, suddenly came up was for um, the Suffolk County Water Authority will allow the Hampton Bays Water Authority to hook up to a well, I don't know where it's located, on the other side of the canal somewhere? Actually, they're water main on the other side of the canal. Water main. Water main, it comes right to Peconic Road, and we're right at Peconic Road. We have an interconnect with them now in case anything does happen, which has happened. We had a break underneath the bridge. At, uh, like nine years ago, and we had to turn the water on temporarily till we got the water main fixed underneath the bridge because it had frozen. Mm -hmm. And we had no problem with them there at that point. So, but this, I, I guess kind of what I'm personally getting at is that, you know, how the town um, approves or goes ahead with the CPI when there's no water solution in pl no solution to the water fl flow problems in place. I mean, what happens if you guys never come up with an agreement? I'm to put you on the spot, but well, we'd have to know. go to one of the other options, which would be um, putting another pipe across the canal from west to east, uh, looking for a new well site up on the uh, hill over there. Um, <laughs> we could put an elevated storage tank up there, but I don't know if that would go. Oh, over that there. could go over <laughs> very well, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I don't think we want to do that. Um, or um, the other option is to install a booster station on the west side and make the whole east side its own separate pressure zone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, Maria has some questions. First question. What are maintenance costs, overall cost of carbon filtration system, and where are the dollars coming from? <coughs> All right. Capital costs are estimated at $1.2 million. Uh, the Water District uh, applied for a grant through New York State, and New York State has uh, granted, I guess you would say, uh, $720,000 to Hampton Bay's Water District to install these. The remaining money is coming from a fund that the it, that the water district was received um, ten years ago for MTBE litigation. Okay, should we be concerned about personal drilled wells in and around Hampton Bays? Uh, like private wells, I guess. I guess that's what they mean by personal. 
uh, if they're in a direction of the plume, which which is heading from uh, the property here on Ponquag to the south, uh, I've uh, got in touch with our GIS through the town, and we've he's been they've been generous enough to give me a whole list of people. I'm working on a letter, compiling a letter to send to the people that are not on the system to hopefully have them hook up to us. Yeah. And it's only a matter of about 40 people that are on wells. But if you do, town. if you do have a private well, you would we would recommend you having it tested. Uh, for the perfluorinated compounds, and if you call the water district, they can give you a couple of reputable labs to go to. But I think if you call the health department, the health, health department might volunteer to do it for free. Okay. What is the annual budget for water filtration at the contaminated wells, and how long will it be needed? Will it need to be in service? Well, there is really no budget now since it's brand new. Um, we won't have to change out carbon next year. So in 2019, there'll have to be, or 2020, there'll be a line item for the changing of the uh, carbon. Maybe $100,000, plus or minus. Uh, and that'll come right out from the, the budget. Uh, that depends on the plume. If the plume is gone in two years, then we can get rid of them in two years. If the plume is still there in 20 years, we'll still have them there in 20 years. Are any contaminated wells being used now? Will the filtration system remove all of the contamination? None of the wells that are uh, affected are being used now. Like I said, when I first started, they were, uh, all three of those wells we just using, we'll be using seasonally, even though we have a carbon filter on them. And will the filtration remove all the contamination? Yes. Okay. When you find out the source of the PSOAs, will they be held accountable for the cost of the cleanup and how? Uh, that you'll have to ask. Uh, who are we talking about now? Lawyers. Um, the lawyers or the DEC? If they if they find the source, then um, that might be up to the DEC. Um, okay, we are holding those questions for the DEC then, okay. if you defer to them. Because no. they have to do a further in investigation into it anyway. Please clarify whether or not the water purity of two, possibly three wells has been permanently damaged with PFOA. The filtration process designed to do address PFOAs only and the other water impurities. I'm sorry, I'm reading what's <laughs> down here. Uh, the wells are have the PFOA in them on until the, the, the cleanup is um, complete and the plume is gone. It will always have it in there. However, the carbon will remo remove all PFOA and PFOS, which is a sister compound. Um, the filtration process is designed to absorb the compound onto the carbon. Um, when the carbon gets full, it is uh, hauled off to a facility and regenerated, which they, the big whole process they do. Um, And it will address it will address all PFO PFCs we'll call them including PFOA and other wi water and uh, impurities. It will not address the iron issue that somebody had mentioned. Um. Thank you. Are you saying private wells in Shinnecock Hills are not affected? No, they're not affected at all because you have the canal between them. Us and them. How deep in the aquifer has the plume spread? And do any of the wells here in Hampton Bays reach into the Magathi layer of the aquifer? Uh, all the wells in Ham Hampton Bays are glacial. Um, the plume, as far as we know it, 
Uh, one's 90, one's 120, and the other one's 107. So we know that it's at least 120 feet down. I, I think that um, we want to get DC, DC up here, but I have one different kind of question, if you could answer it. I'm just kind of curious. Um, I don't know how many municipalities or hamlets or villages have their own water district out here on the east end, but I read somewhere that, that at one point in time there was a vote in Hampton Bays on whether or not to become part of the Suffolk County Water Authority. Do you know anything about that? No, it was never all? a vote, but uh, up until uh, I think Anna was the last one elected that uh, Suffolk County actually went to her and tried to put in a bid for the water district because we are the only thing stopping them from East Quag and Southampton. We are, they want us bad. And uh, Anna said it would be political suicide for anybody in office to do that with the people of Hampton Bays. That's something that we all own. We're all part of it. Right. It's, you know, it's what little the one thing we have left we lost our police you know so trying to hold on mm -hmm. oh, I was just curious okay um, uh, no. department no. Maria this has to be the last one water question okay. <laughs> how often is the water tested and why does it taste so bad? <laughs> I'm just reading. <laughs> That's a good question. The, the carbon will actually make your water taste better. Um, it is known to take out taste and odor problems. Um, how often is it tested? Well, we do our bacteria uh, twice a month, and then uh, all the, the PFAS has got to be used once a month now, right? We have to do it once a month yep. in all our wells. And... Uh, all the other stuff is uh, once every three months. We do uh, volatiles, um, inorganic, uh, inorganics, um, volatiles, and um, synthetics are done um, once every 18 months. It's a perfluorinated compound, and it's not in any of the categories that we just discussed. It's it's a perfluorinated compound. It's um it's not a a volatile. It's not a inorganic. It's a compound in its own. You might say so. Um, yeah, it's called perfluorinated. There's six of them that they test for. Alrighty. Um. Uh, how often do they test for them? At plant one, they test for them every month. Excuse me, I can give you a card, we can read it, but we're trying to get this recorded and the acoustics don't come up when you speak from there. So we're trying to get your question out to everyone so that the people viewing this get the same response to the answers. Um, okay. All righty, and what I think what we'll do next, uh, we thank you very much. And I think we have some uh, gentlemen here from the DEC. So since a lot of this has been deferred, the discussion has been deferred to them, we'll ask them to come up next and we'll further the discussion. So we're not ending the water discussion. We're just sort of having the water department. Now we'll have the DEC talk about the PFOAs a little bit. Hi, I'm Brian Jankowskis from the New York State DEC. I'm the project manager for the Hampton Bays Fire Department site. And I'm John Swartout. I'm a uh, section chief uh, in the DEC office up in Albany. Uh, Brian works in my section. And uh Steve Karpinski, New York State Department <coughs> of Health. I work for the Bureau of Environmental Exposure Investigation, and um, we're the component of the state team that, that looks at the exposure end of things. And um, I am the, s the supervisor for Steve Berninger, who's next to me, who is the Department of Health Project Manager. Thank you very much. Um, if, could you pick up where they were, some of the issues that they were saying they wanted to defer to you about? Okay. Or, yeah. Um, I think one of the questions was where uh, is the contamination potentially coming from? Um, 
the contaminant is known as PFOS, which is a potentially related to AFFF. It's an aqueous firefighting foam. Um, as a result, um, there's only so many places that use that type of material. Um, just to the north of the public supply well field is the Hampton Bay Fire Department. Um, we have had them do a fill out a form regarding the use of this chemical. Um, as with all fire departments within the state of New York, uh, their form came back with yes, they did have this chemical within the fire department. So they are a potential site for this contamination that's impacting the public supply well field. Uh, we have negotiated an order with them um, and they are in the process of preparing a work plan to do an investigation at their property to find out if there is a source of contamination at that property of the PFOS that's impacting the groundwater. Oh, thank you. Um, and what will be the, can you sort of uh, elaborate on what the next steps are then? Uh, so they are preparing a work plan for our review and approval. Uh, we uh, anticipate that coming uh, this December, uh, at which point we will then come up with uh, either give them approval of the work plan uh, or give them comments. They will revise the work plan um, and then we will approve it. They will go out and uh, do investigations. These will be looking at uh, various possible source locations on the property, the leach field, the uh, dry wells, the storage area for the chemical. Um, based on that, they'll also collect samples uh, from the soils, the groundwater, uh, and see what they find. Um, if the levels are determined not to be considered of a source, then we'll have to look at another potential source in the area to try and find out where is this contamination coming from. Uh, if they, if a source is identified at that property, uh, then we will move forward with a full-blown remedial investigation uh, to define the extent of the contamination and develop some sort of remedial action to remove the contamination from the environment so it no longer impacts the supply well field. Uh, there will be public meetings uh, to discuss the findings and the proposed remedy at that point. Uh, where uh, people from the Hampton Bay Civic Association can come as well as other people from the area uh, to hear what was found and kind of add any additional information. Uh, thank you. Um, then, um, So then just right now it's just the fire department property then that is the potential site at this point in time? That's the one that we are looking at right now. Okay. They're close proximity just up uh, there was uh, some work that was done by Suffolk, Suffolk County Department of Health Services where they put some vertical profile points, which is basically they drilled some, uh, they had a drill rig out in the area. They collected samples vertically through the groundwater column to identify where contamination was. And they s did these points all around the supply well field. Uh, and the one that came up with the highest contamination of the PFOS was located between the supply well field and the fire department itself. Okay, I thank you. Um, we're going to ask you just to get a little closer to the oh, mic. Sorry. sorry about that. I, I'm the worst with it too. Uh, I guess one question is, is, is the fire department going to investigate themselves? Um, but I guess you're doing the investigation. Uh, right? The fire district is the one um, that is obtained a consultant to conduct the investigation uh, and they've negotiated an order with the department to work together to identify and conduct the investigation. With in conjunction with the DEC is yeah. that what you're saying? So they you know they have to do the work with our approvals and move on from there. Okay. Right so D DEC will be overseeing it but the the consultant hired by the fire district will actually conduct the the investigations. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't 
think that's going to be enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, that I think that uh, it was it was asked already, but uh, but I just want to just run it by you one more time. Are carbon filters the only solution? Uh, carbon filters tend to be the solution that people utilize the most. Um, we have another site up in Hoosick Falls, New York, where the carbon filter system like the one proposed here has shown to be very successful uh, in removing contamination from the drinking water supply for the village of Hoosick Falls. Um, they've also been placed on private wells um, where they are not connected to the public water supply, uh, just smaller versions. Um, and they have found to be effective there as well. So I mean, carbon is a very good alternative or good method to remove the contaminant from the water supply for the home or the area. And my understanding is that the contaminant doesn't degrade. Is that correct? Uh, no, it has very. It sticks around for a while. It's not a doesn't degrade very well. Yeah. So the problem is it has to be remediated totally from the soil. Then I understand. Um, you have to do, it's, it's hard to remediate from the soil, it's hard to remediate in general, it's very resistant, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tough chemical. But, uh. Okay, another question that was just given to me, are there any other risks from the contaminated plume, uh, soil, plants, and exposure to children, say, playing in the area? Uh, the groundwater plume is uh, obviously below the surface, <coughs> mm -hmm. um, so its uh, contact will be very limited for a lot of people. Uh, it would mainly be the public water supply, and as far as the children aspect, I'll leave that to Department of Health. Yeah, we, we would not expect there to be any exposures that children would, would run into. Again, this, um, this material is getting into the ground and sinking down. Um, the public water supply wells are at greater than 100 feet below ground surface. So we know that that's basically where this, these contaminants are going. Um, so they're not on the surface. Um, they're not in the soil in people's yards or anything like that. So there's, again, there's really no mechanism by which pe um, children or anybody would come into contact with other than through drinking the water. And again, that, that particular exposure route has been, um, has been ceased. <coughs> Oh, thank you. Um, I think one of the questions that was asked was private wells in the area. There are. There was a survey done by Suffolk County Department of Health Services, uh, I believe in conjunction with the Water Authority, uh, where they did identify a couple private wells in the area, um, and they have uh, sure. reached out to try and sample those private wells. Yeah, and Suffolk County does a real, very thorough job of identifying um, people who are, or properties that are using private wells, and, um, and they have done a lot of private well sampling. Um, if, again, if the wells are in an area that appears to be impacted, um, my understanding is that Suffolk County um, will sample those wells, and, um, and I, I believe it's at no chart, no cost to, uh, to the resident, but don't hold me to that, <coughs> please. <laughs> All right, um, just before we go on with questions from the audience, I'm a bit confused. If these, uh, if they can't be removed and they have a long life, what are we talking about? How are we going to solve this issue? You can, there's a couple techniques that we can do. One is excavate them out. If it's, say, it's like in a localized area within the soils, uh, you can excavate the soils and remove the contaminant from the, the site itself. Uh, th that would be great for a source area. Uh, for groundwater, as with the carbon uh, that was presented earlier, that's another way to remove it. It's just hard to destroy it. In so the it can be removed. It, it can be removed. It's just hard to... It doesn't like the breakdown. Uh, there's a lot of chemicals out there that will uh, break down in the environment over time. This one likes to stick around because it is a very stable uh, chemical. Uh, that's one of the, when they developed it, uh, they did a good job on this one. It's not environmentally friendly. But so the carbon will remove it eventually. Yeah, it'll get, like uh, I was indicated before, it'll get trapped within the carbon. 
I missed that point, sorry. No, no it's okay. Um, next question, aren't there regulations governing storage of firefighting foam? How is it supposed to be stored? Uh, as far as regulations for firefighting foam, there's not a, it's an unregulated chemical. Yeah, I mean, un until the last year or two, it, it was not re regulated by anybody for any purpose. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm sure there were, you know, standard practices maybe that fire departments or um, corporations that, you know, that had firefighting foams on their properties probably used for storage and use of it, but it was not regulated by the state or the federal government as a hazardous waste or hazardous substance. Um, you know, it, it just was not, not, as you may be aware, there's thousands of, of chemical formulations that are not regulated by anyone. There's on only certain, certain ones that are, and th this was not one of them. And now, is there a, supposed to be a storage method? Uh, for, for those types of firefighting foams that have these chemicals in, uh, New York State now has banned the use of them, um, except, uh, you know, it, I th in fact, we may have now passed the deadline. There was a there was a time period when they were only allowed to be used for emergency um, situations and not for not for training purposes. I think we either now have passed the deadline or are close to the deadline when they can't be used even for emergency purposes. So they've had to um, switch to different formulations. The the the, for the original formulation had high levels of these two chemicals that were re referred to as PFOA and PFOS. Uh, they have newer formulations now that still have perfluorinated compounds in them, but very low or, or no, none of the PFOA and PFOS, which are the two that EPA has set the, um, the drinking water guidance levels on. So, and they're actually doing research now trying to find some alternative completely to the perfluorinated compounds. So it's the uh, U.S. Navy in particular um, is trying to find other alternatives to that type of compound. And how would they dispose of what they have? Uh, actually, the federal government has already collected much of it from the, like say, the Air Force, the Navy, et cetera, um, and they're actually incinerating it because it is, it's so difficult to get rid of in any other way. So it's, it's a fairly expensive way to dispose of it, but uh, that's what they're doing with quite a bit of it. Thank you. Next question, are you aware of any usage guidelines that volunteer fire departments have to follow when using that material? Well, the volunteer fire departments are in the fo have to follow the same um, rule that came out from DEC. It was maybe a year ago it came out about the phasing out of the use of it. So the, the volunteer fire departments won't be able to use it in the future either. And they will also, if they have that, you know, those old formulations of the AFFF uh, firefighting foam, they will have to, um, in one manner or another, um, probably turn it back to their suppliers. I'm not sure what kind of arrangements have been made between the man manufacturers, the suppliers, the purchasers, but um, in any <coughs> case, they, they won't be able to use it anymore. Thank you. Next question. Have you investigated other fire departments for contamination of PFOS or PFOAs here in Southampton Town? And do you anticipate contamination in other areas as well? Uh, the answer is no on whether we've investigated other fire departments. And um, I guess we'll be in a better position to answer the second part of the question after we investigate the fire department property here. I mean, if we do find that that is a source just from the kind of general fire department use, then that would certainly be a warning signal that, it, you know, we may have the same issue at other fire departments. So the, an the uh, answer is unknown at this time. I know in other states they have uh, identified some other volunteer fire departments as potential sources within their local communities, uh, particularly in New Hampshire. 
are the test results conducted at the interval stated earlier available to residents? If so, how are the results assessed? Um, the results of the samples from the public water supply wells, I'm assuming, is, yeah. is uh, where, where we're yeah. what we're talking about. Um, public water suppliers um, are required by the state of New York to to sample their public water, their wells on a regular basis. And um, the gentleman um, from the water supply did describe the, the, the different interval intervals and the different types of analysis that need to be done and it, it all depends on what is known about potential groundwater contamination in the area and now that we know that there are these um, these impacts to the well um, like you said they they have to sample it on a monthly basis um, is what it comes up with so um, these these results um, kicked into action the response that the water district took they took the wells offline as soon as they found out and were able to make sure that um, they were not um, distributing these contaminants at concentrations that are potentially harmful um, and that's the same response that any water district in New York State would have to take um, they're all very closely regulated by Department of Health and by the Suffolk County Department of Health Services as well. I mean, there's, m there's multiple layers of, of review that goes into um, looking at these results that, uh, for public water supply wells. And again, it's very, um, very strictly regulated. Um, water suppliers have very little leeway in terms of what they can do once they know that there's contamination in their wells. So it's, um, again, it's all designed to, to make sure that we can um, take care of exposures through drinking water as quickly as possible. I don't know if that <coughs> I will also the just add, Mr. Warner just said to me that the test results from the water department are available at the water department. So you can contact them. Right, yes, that was the other part of the question, yes. And these, th these data are always available and the water district um, sends out a yearly report. Again, that's required by New York State. Every single water um, supplier has to provide the same kind of report to tell the people who are consuming the water what, you know, what if any contaminants are in the water and what's being done to address those, those contaminants. All right, next question. What does the fire department use this chemical for and are they still using it? Uh, they used to use it to put out fires uh, and then also potentially to stop a fire from occurring if uh, there was a gas spill or wh whatnot on the ground that or from a tanker truck they would foam the vehicle or their truck to prevent uh, a, an incident from occurring. Right so it would be things like gasoline or or diesel or fuel oil it would be those those kinds of flammable materials that it's hard to deal with with water you know if you, if you hit them with water it just spreads it around uh, the foam cuts off the air supply uh, to the fire, and, and that's why, for example, the uh, it was actually developed by the Navy for use on uh, aircraft carriers and things like that, and uh, adopted also by the by the Air Force. Um, so it's part of the ocean. All right. Are any of you involved with the water quality issues at the Bel Air Motel? raw sewage and cooking oil running into the bay? No. No. <laughs> no. Are there any other questions? Um, yeah, we do have one more question, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it sort of paraphrase. I'm gonna need your help in understanding. The threshold, it's 70 parts per billion or uh, something? Trillion. trillion. Trillion, okay. That, maybe you could explain what that means and, you know, and I gather that there's different standards but from different states, if that's correct, if perhaps you could explore that a little bit. And then what is your position? Is there a public position of what you think is acceptable or the DEC thinks is acceptable or what the threshold should be? Because I know my limited understanding is that there's been some concern, um, discussion about whether the threshold should be lower. I think some states have half what New York State has in terms of threshold. 
I may be incorrect on that. <laughs> uh, no, there, there are, uh, that is a health advisory level that was developed by the EPA. Uh, there are multiple states that have accepted that or utilized that value. However, there's other uh, states that have not and they've developed their own. Uh, I am not in the development process of those numbers. I tend to use the numbers that are provided to me. So, uh, Well, again, there's, um, there's a number of different um, concentrations that the EPA associates with various um, potential health e effects. Um, the 70 part per trillion level is what's termed a health advisory level. Um, it, and there, it, it's actually um, not a standard at this point. New York State is working on developing a standard for um, these, these compounds. Um, and it's called a maximum contaminant level, an MCL. Uh, there's MCLs for, um, I don't know exactly, um, a couple of hundred chemicals that water districts have to sample for on a regular basis that are already regulated. Um, these PFOAs are not regulated specifically with, a, with an MCL, although, the, again, New York State is, is working on developing those at this point in time. But um, uh, again, the, the EPA dis, uh, determined that this 70 part per trillion level was a, um, a very conservative number and a very um, protective number of, of to, to, to ensure that people don't get sick. It's extremely low. Parts per trillion, um, and I wish I had these, um, these analogies, um, it's like one drop of water in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. I mean, it's an extremely small amount. And again, it's very protective. The EPA goes over and above um, trying to establish these concentrations that will be, um, give us some level of comfort that it's not going to cause um, adverse health effects to people who are consuming them at, that no at those levels. Um, so it's... Um, Again, it's, it's also a developing science. There's um, new information coming in every day. Um, we're learning more and more, or trying to learn more and more about what potential impacts these chemicals have. Uh, as Brian said, there's thousands of them, and um, you know, it's, a, it's a daunting task, and um, you know, we're doing the best we can to try to um, make sure that we're, we're being protective of public health. Okay. Thank you and, very and much. A, and a, until, until that actual state MCL is developed, uh, New York has decided to utilize the uh, EPA, you know, health advisory level of, of 70 part per trillion. So for the time being, that's what's being used. We don't, we really don't have any idea what the um, end result will be of this current process to develop right. state specific um, numbers. Has anybody gotten sick from it? Um, no, not that we're aware of. I mean, there's people in the past who have worked in manufacturing um, situations where they've used very high concentrations of these chemicals, and um, you know there were adverse health effects and people who were exposed at extremely high levels. So there is some knowledge about what happens, but um, when you try to look at the, the more realistic exposures that we're talking about here, um, th there is no information to indicate that anybody's gotten sick from them at this at this point in time. It's, and that's a very difficult association to make. Um, you know, there's uh, a lot of people being exposed to a lot of different chemicals throughout our lives, and um, to try to associate a specific al um, health outcome, adverse health outcome to an exposure, is is an extremely difficult. Um, task to, to accomplish. I thank you. That's a very important question. I want to ask one more question because then I want to call Nicole Hart up. Uh, well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to have N Nicole talk for a couple of minutes and then we, I'll ask yeah. you all to stay up and then we okay. can take more questions. Yeah, also there was, w there was one question earlier that was deferred to DEC too right. that we should come back about to. About costs. Probably. Is that what you were talking uh, about? About responsibility, you know, once we identify who, you know. Right, responsibility for the cost of cleanup. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, that was my question. Okay. <laughs> Did you want me to answer that now? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, so, yes, the question was about the, once DEC does determine who's responsible, you know, whether it's the something that happened at the fire department property or turns out to be something different, 
are they would they be responsible for um, the problem at the well field as well as the cleanup at the source and the answer is is yes it, it for um, wherever the source of it turns out to be um, we would be listing that area on our state registry of inactive hazardous waste disposal sites and the um, and then the responsible party um, would be responsible both for cleanup investigation and cleanup of the source area as well as any off-site issues which would include the you know the groundwater would include the um, the impacts to the um, water supply uh, well field um, so for example taking over the cost of 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 maybe the uh, uh, changing out the the carbon in the uh, in the uh, um, treatment system that's going to be put in the, at the well field and if the if the if the treatment system hadn't been put on the well field yet potentially they could be responsible even for the upfront cost of that although in this case it sounds like the upfront funding has already been obtained to put the system in and we probably won't know the exact source of the contamination before the system is put in in any case yes so what you're saying is when when you find out where the contamination comes from, you will hold the people responsible for it accountable. Okay, then should someone ask, should I be drinking bottled water? Um, no, there's, if you're on the public water supply um, for East Hampton, there's no reason to use bottled water. Again, We're in that Southampton. Wa Southampton, I'm, I'm sorry. I live up in Albany, it's all. <laughs> <laughs> We're in Hampton Bays. We have our Hampton own water Bays. district. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but anyway, the, 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 um, the important thing is that the, the water supply that's, um, that's distributed to the customers is, is monitored very closely, as we talked about before. Um, so there, there really is no reason to, um, to use bottled water. Okay, and the last question I have here, which we know the answer to, is is the fire department still using the foam? Which is no. Exactly. I'm sorry, you had said that if it is found, the um, fire department is found responsible, you said it will be listed on your website as oh. what? Oh, I said the, wherever the source of this contamination is, the source area, would be listed on the New York State Registry of Inactive Hazardous Waste Disposal Sites. Okay, and I'm gonna ask Nicole Hart to come up here. She's been so kind, because we had, we had meant to have her come on earlier. And she's in charge of the remediation at, uh, the, at the canal property right now. Well, so if you would be so kind, just to sort of talk about what it what the remediation is about and the process. And then we'll take questions for Nicole and more questions as long as we have time for the, for the other gentleman here from the DEC. Okay, the site that I'm speaking of, uh, I, don't, you, I heard that you had mentioned it was, C, I don't know if CPI is the same location, but this is, the address is one, the parcels of one through seven at North Highway in Hampton Bays. Um, as far as I know it, it was a former bait and tackle shop. Um, and. Uh, in 2012, there was a phase two conducted. And what a phase two is, is basically soil and groundwater was collected. They come in with a piece of machinery called a geoprobe, and they collect soil at certain depths. At certain depths um, in the soil and in the groundwater, they discovered that there was gasoline contamination. Um, the gasoline was found to be um, from the source, was from former underground storage tanks. Um, as of right now, we know that there is, um, there was three, there was two gasoline underground storage tanks, which was removed in, um, just recently in October um, the 11th of this year, and there was one fuel oil tank. Recently, on the 27th of October, we also discovered two underground storage tanks, which is under the building themselves, which I believe to be the source of the contamination. Um, what we have done is we've delineated so in delineation means we know where it's coming from and where it went, uh, horizontally and vertically. So we installed the contractor, and the DEC is overseeing this. We are not um, paying for this. The uh, responsible party is doing the work. So what happens is they submit reports, and I approve them. 
And so at this time, we've installed nine monitoring wells. These monitoring wells are sampled quarterly, and um, the source have, has been mitigated, not entirely, not until the, the building itself is demolished. And the permits are to be uh, put in this week. And once that is done, then they can tear down the building and expose the tanks, and the soil can be removed. And we can continue to monitor the groundwater. At this time, the groundwater, the plume, is stable, and we have delineated it to the point of behind the building. The groundwater direction is in a westerly flow <coughs> towards the canal, which has not been impacted, based on the monitoring network that we have. So if uh, there's any questions, I'm here to answer. I do have some questions that have been handed in, uh, and just bear with me uh, with reading. The first one is um, there. Let's see, spill. The spill number was assigned after phase two in 2012, but the phase one was done in 2006, uh, and was recommended for phase two. Why was there a delay of six years uh, from the well, even more from 2006 to 2012 till now? Uh, and and why did the de uh, decon decontamination efforts only begin relatively recently, from what I understand? In 2006, phase one was conducted. At that time, no soil and groundwater was collected, but there was note that there was underground storage tanks. So there was no confirmation that there was any contamination. So um, when the company who did that, they were, t they were just reporting the discovery of tanks that there was no active spill that they were aware of. But once they started collecting soil and groundwater in 2012, that's when confirmation was made that the indeed there was a spill. So they was unaware in 2006 that there was a spill. But in 2012, there was, so there was still a... a there, was, there was evidence, there was a an lab analysis done on the soil and the groundwater. Um, have you determined that the amount of oil? You said that the oil has not re reached the bay yet, is that correct? I mean the canal, sorry. The dissolved plume, no. 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 It and is very difficult to determine how much is spilled. Okay. And have you determined, so then you haven't determined how much is in the ground, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I can tell you concentrations, which are fairly minimal, and this has happened years ago. Uh, it, it was undetected, though, until they started doing um, sampling. Do you have questions over there? Yeah. Okay. Again, why was the delay from 2012 until now before any remediation was begun? There was no detection or spill notified to our office into 2012. But I'm saying why from 2000, it's now 2017. Correct. So why from 2012? You said you found the soil in 2012. So Correct. Why it's now 2017? What's the delay from 12? The way the process goes is that, so they were doing their due diligence at the notification of the spill. Then what happens is then the spill gets signed out and that we require them to do some sampling. If in a timely fashion they do not do any sampling, um, then the state will take it over. The state looks and prioritizes these spills based on whether they're sensitive receptors or not. A sensitive receptor could be contaminated well, surface waters. And we deemed that the surface waters were not impacted and there was no private wells in the vicinity. Therefore, we allowed the responsible party to do their due diligence and install the wells. And we found that this, wa that this was a stable plume. So we are overseeing it, and that's why the installation of the wells have occurred. There's also been problems with permitting. And I believe with the contractor themselves of who was going to be responsible for certain actions. Who is the, the responsible party? I don't have that information. You could look that up. That's not necessarily a DEC. There's been multiple um, owners to my knowledge. And who is paying for the remediation at this point? Uh, the responsible party has hired multiple contractors to, to, to perform the work. But you can't say who the responsible party is? I'm not sure exactly their name because the way it's, it's presented to me, it's from the reports are from their contractor. And I'd have, I don't have that information on. I can leave my card and you can call my office. Okay, thank you. Um, based on the degree of remediation, will there be any limitation on the use of the property and will it be safe for residential use? At the, t this, this bill remain active until the department's, um, you know, uh, approves its closure. 
and therefore multiple um, quarterly sampling and soil sampling would have to be conducted. So at that time, if it meets the standards, we would close out the spill. If in the event it does not meet the standards, we would have them do an exposure report. And at that time, we would deem the property to be um, the spill closed or remain open. So therefore, there isn't an answer right now? Is that what you're saying? Right now, they ha we haven't completed the entire cleanup. And when do you anticipate completing the entire cleanup? Once we remove the tanks and we can see exactly what, you know, how much uh, soil we can get out, that'll be helpful. And that's to be done in the next month. Now, I may have misunderstood you, but I thought you said that you took out two tanks uh, and then you discovered that there were additional tanks under the building, is that A correct? A total of three tanks have been removed and two tanks were found during further demolition of the, pr of the building. So you were saying that the two additional tanks were just recently discovered? They were, and they were pumped out and they had to be removed upon... It, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to inter interrupt. Upon the demolition of the building itself. Okay. Is there a concern then that perhaps there's other tanks that still haven't been uh, recognized or found? Is there, and therefore, would you be looking around the property even more? Or well, when they conducted the phase two, that's the soil and the groundwater collected, knowing that we believed that the source was under the building. So when we, these tanks were discovered, we had a feeling that that was the issue. Uh -huh. But they couldn't be exposed until we had access to the building being um, partially demolished. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions regarding the CPI and the oil tanks before we move on? Get her card. No, no, no. Thank you for letting me join. All right. In the meantime, I'm just going to read one of these questions for the DEC. Someone wants to know, are there any other contaminants like degreasers we should be testing for with the fire department? And what are the health effects of the PBOAs and the PFOS? I'll answer the part about other contaminants first. Uh, the, the investigation that is done on the fire department property will include some sampling for all of the you know, a whole list of, of potential contaminants that we generally look for at every site that we investigate statewide. Uh, so although it will be concentrated more heavily on the uh, PFOA and PFOS and related compounds, there will be some looking to make sure there's not other contaminants. And Steve? And again, and, and to follow up on that a little bit, um, like I said before, um, the public water supplies have to sample for a wide range of contaminants on a regular basis, um, you know, again, those are contaminants that have a maximum contaminant level associated with them. Um, and, as, and, and as far as health impacts, um, there's been some links to birth defects. Um, I think liver tox, uh, liver impacts are, are, are some of what is suspected. Um, and again, these are adverse health effects that are associated with very high exposure levels, um, concentrations that are very much higher than what we're talking about here in the drinking water. Um, so again, it's not a, it's not a, a situation where you could, um, you know, be expecting people to be getting sick, as, you know, get, uh, uh, getting specific sick sicknesses as a result of this exposure. It's just um, that the concentrations aren't really high enough to, to make that association or to expect any of those kind of adverse health effects to occur. Thank you. Moving back to Nicole for a second. How soon after the 2000, after 2012, did the developer install the monitoring wells? Um, the completion was done by 2014, and that was the soil and groundwater, and then the monitoring wells were installed by 2015 and have continued to be sampled quarterly. Thank you. And then did the DEC present the responsible party from, prevent, sorry, the responsible party from taking action to remove the tanks before now? No. I believe it was permit holdups. So, we, but we were still able to 
do an investigation without having to demolish the building, which seemed to be issues with permits in towns and village. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know if there are any other questions for Nicole. You need to write them down. Mary, I'll pick them up. And can I just say, we, we do have some fact sheets and some information on the back table um, from the EPA and from the DC and from the Department of Health um, with a little bit more information on the potential adverse health effects. I know I didn't really go into too much detail, but there is information back there um, you know, that, that you guys can pick up. And um, okay. okay, next question for the DEC. If the fire department is found to be responsible as they are a volunteer fire department, where will they get the money to pay for the repairs? Uh, the uh, the Question investigation was for the DEC. The investigation uh, that we have agreed to in the order was signed by the fire district. So. What's that mean? The, it, the order was signed by the fire district. Not yeah. the volunteer fire department. Right, because the fire district is a is a public taxing entity. Um, the fire, the volunteer fire department, does the actual fire protection work, but the property is owned by the by the fire district. So it is a it is you know a tax a taxing entity. It's a it's essentially it's a unit of local government. So, so whether they would be able to get, let's say, you know, some kind of uh, state support somehow for it, or I, I don't know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's an unknown, unknown question at this point as to whether they would be able to get some kind of support besides their normal ability to tax the people in the fire district. Okay, is it true that 70 parts per trillion is not harmful? but 72 and 79 parts per trillion is harmful. It's first part, second part, how does this chemical affect the public health? Is this small amount really a problem or are we wasting our time? I'll defer the last question, I do have a opinion on that but um, no the 70 part per trillion level is extremely safe it's extremely conservative um, again uh, the, the people that come up with these numbers uh, use a variety of information um, about the potential health adverse health effects and a lot of it comes from studies done on animals and um, you know they try to um, associate or, or you know use the information we have on animal impacts again which are impacts that are that we find out about due to very high exposures they you know again I, they pr expose animals to very high levels and see what happens to them um, and and again they can identify certain organ systems or certain functions of the body that are impacted in these small animals and then we take that information and and try to pr predict what kind of impacts might happen to humans at various concentrations and again this 70 part per trillion concentration that the EPA, EPA came up with is an extremely um, conservative and, 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 and protective number. Um, would somebody get sick at 72 parts per trillion? No. 79 parts per trillion? No. All the way up to you know some level that you know again we really don't know at this point in time but um, it's not a hard and fast number. It's it's really a number that is is kind of used as a guideline right now. And again, like I said, we're the, the state of New York is working on developing maximum contaminant levels for these particular contaminants. Um, and again, it's going to take a lot of data and information into into account. And um, you know, we'll hopefully we'll have something that will continue to be protective down the, down the road a little bit. Thank you. Back to Nicole. One question is, what was the permit holdup? I'm unaware of that because I'm dealing with the environmental aspects. I am unaware of the permit holdup, just that um, I was informed by the contractor that they were unable to obtain permits to continue with the um, demolition of the buildings. Okay, next question. The east side of the canal 
looks like it's not being maintained. Exposed tree roots, severe erosion. Should that be addressed during this cleanup period? That is not a uh, petroleum related issue. So my unit would not be taking care of that. Um, it would probably natural habitat. But if it's a public right of way, it would maybe the town. Again, I don't know how the jurisdictions work, but my um, oversight is for the petroleum related issue only. What about the CPI site? Have you checked for abandoned tanks on the property? I don't live around here, so I don't know what that CPI site is. Is that? On the other side. Yes, yeah, so when you say the other side, so that's on why the, the western side the of the canal. The parcels that I'm dealing with are subject properties one through seven on North Highway. So this was um, the former bait, sh bait and tackle shop. I don't know it to be a CPI property. It's see, on the other side. See, what it is is that we say CPI because it's something called a planned development district, so it involves multiple parcels. So your bait and tackle shop is one, uh, one parcel of multiple ones that are all part of one project. Okay. And, the wet, so, and it, it spans both the east and west side of the canal. So the west side of the, of the canal, there's this large building that used to be called Canoe Place Inn, CPI. Okay. Mm -hmm. And th I think the question is directed as to whether that particular property has been checked for underground tanks and also whether the bait and tackle was one, if I'm not mistaken, one of three parcels on the, on the east side of the canal, whether the other parcels have also been checked for underground tanks. The parcel of that we're doing, we're conducting this investigation is the one north on road. So only that building. At this time, I would have to go and do a search. I can leave my card if you'd like to call, and I can go and look up for any spills in the vicinity if that would be helpful. Petroleum related. <laughs> OK, we're back to PFOAs and PFOS. <coughs> the question is, is the plume spreading? Can bivalves be a secondary source? What would the time frame be? for plume to reach salt water? And also, what are their health effects of prolonged exposure? Right now, we're just at the beginning of the investigation for this plume. Um, one of the questions, I believe, was bivalves. Um, I believe that most of the groundwater was heading towards the public supply well as it was drawing it in. Um, as the contamination went into one supply well, they shut it down uh, when the contamination got high, and then it headed towards the next one. So I do not believe that the contamination uh, made it to a surface water body. However, we do not have a lot of information at this time uh, because, once again, we are still at the beginning of the investigation. But but with with the with the bivalves, I know that's one of the one of the things that uh, uh, the Suffolk County Department of Health Services is starting to look into in general in Suffolk County with some of the other locations um, where you know similar contamination is happening in Suffolk County where it is going into some of the um, tidal waterways. So that is a an area where where the county is starting to look at that issue of whether or not you know, um, there would be impact to the bivalves. It might be a problem then to people that are, that are eating the, uh, the bivalves. I don't know if you want to say any more on that. But. Didn't the county actually um, do some sort of well th that initially discovered the contamination, or am I mistaken on that? I thought the county was involved at the detection uh, level. The Suffolk County Department of Health Services uh, got involved when the supply well was uh, identified with detections. They took samples uh, in August and September of 2016 around the public supply well field uh, to try and understand where the contamination was coming from that was impacting the supply well field. So. I have to have you. I, I need I need you to write the question down. Uh, I'm so sorry because we're taping it so that we can benefit the entire community, not just people present tonight. Um, 
So what, what I will ask, though, is that we really appreciate all this information. Will there be any report on the investigation as it progresses so that will be, you know, without having a community forum that the public will know about? Uh, yes, there will be a report uh, at each phase of the project. Uh, right now, the initial phase is called a site characterization. The main goal is to see if we can uh, find a source of contamination on the property. Uh, a report will be developed that will be available. Uh, we'll have all the results from the sampling activities conducted by the fire district. Um, after that, if there is a source, they'll move on to the remedial investigation phase that will uh, further evaluate the extensive contamination on the property as well as off the property. Uh, that report will also be available. And after that report is issued, there'll be a proposed plan to address any contamination, at which point we will have a public uh, meeting to discuss the proposed action. Uh, where everyone will be invited to uh, a presentation that will likely be given by me uh, to uh, discuss the findings uh, and provide any input that you may have. Prior to uh, that, is wonderful to have that um, presentation by you, um, but prior to that, when you say the report is available or whatever, is there some mechanism, whether it's online or that the, the community can, you know, access it? Uh, yes, we'll set up a, after the site characterization, if it's uh, identified as a source is there, we'll set up a document repository. Uh, usually that's typically a local library. Uh, we will issue fact sheets regarding the uh, upcoming remedial investigation and the identification of where the document repository is. So the public can go and uh, obtain, look at the information that's available at that time. Um, if for some reason uh, this ends after the site characterization phase, uh, that report will be at the uh, in the project file uh, that can be obtained by contacting the department to uh, review the report. Okay, and then the, for the average resident, how would they know how to access that? Uh, by contacting the department. Um, Listserv? Listserv is a standard uh, notification, but I don't think that's going to be on it if it ends at part of the site characterization phase. Um, basically, you can contact the regional office of the DEC, and you can speak with uh, the regional uh, remediation engineer there, uh, where he will then uh, move forward, or they can submit a formal FOIL request to the department to obtain the information. Uh, once again, that can go to the regional office. It's at uh, 50 Circle Road in Stony Brook at the Stony Brook campus. Okay, but would it be possible if we, if you gave us uh, a heads up that at some point instead of having the FOIL that we could be provided and disseminated through the community, whether, you know, our different, our different organizations or online <coughs> or whatever? Um, I can leave my card. That would be terrific. <laughs> <laughs> and Nicole wanted to ask you, is there a mechanism where the public can follow what's going on with the remediation at the canal? Yeah, they can do the same way. I left. I, I'll leave my card, a bunch of cards here. I will also leave um, some quarterly reports if you want to make copies. Okay. So okay. It, there's a website on here that you can access. You can contact me directly, um, and these reports can be copied. Um, but there is an also a format to follow, similar to uh, what he was saying regarding FOIL process, and that's at our office. Thank you so much, and we'll make sure that it's all available on our website also, so that you can go, to, if you want to go to the Civic website, we'll have as much information as you all would provide us. You know. Additionally, the department has a, a website, a web page, where you can find out about all sites. It's not just uh, this site. Uh, if you have any information or you want to know any basic environmental assessment, health assessment, you can go to the department's website, type in the, the name of the site, or if you happen to know the site number uh, or <coughs> spill number, you can punch that in, I believe, and get that information. What is the current status? Well, we do have the spill number for the canal, so that I know we have. And do you have, uh, I, is there a spill number? Is there, uh, I don't we know. We have a site number. Site number? Yeah. Okay, great. 
then we'll provide that also through the website now in anticipation of future information. Um, then I think what we'll do, uh, I think we've pretty much covered most questions because we did want to move on just to talk a little bit about uh, plans for next year. Oh, okay. Maria wants to just reinforce uh, a notice that we have that we've disseminated. Right, just that there's a town board public meeting December 12th at 1 p.m. about extending um, the CPI approval. Yeah, thank you. We didn't mean for you to get up and walk away, but thank you very much. All right. Copies of the proposed law sponsored by Supervisor Schneiderman are on file at the town clerk's office Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 4 or online at southamptontownny.gov. So if you're interested in what the law is and you want to be informed before the meeting, please check it out. Again, I want to thank everybody from DUC, and I want to thank James Warner and John Collins. We really appreciate your time and your information. And what we'd like now is to um, have your uh, feedback on issues we, what, as you probably are familiar with, we try to focus a program uh, each month, and sometimes there will be, you know. Uh, multiple programs that feed together, but we'd like to know the issues that you all would like us to focus on next this upcoming 2018. Um, we we know we have some thoughts, but we'd like to hear from you. So if you could write them, uh, if what do you think? No, it's not monitored. What we're doing is that we're it's being um, videoed so that w the community can see it. They have to shoot this way. Um, but some of the uh, thoughts that we had about for 2018, thank you, thank you very much, uh, were the rezoning that has been, we've had initial meetings, rezoning of downtown, uh, the pattern book that they're developing for downtown, uh, Hampton Bays, Tid a tidal floodgate uh, in the Barrier Island, well, the Dune Road stretch, so that the tidal floodgate would serve both to flush uh, the waters and also help during flooding. And so I don't know if uh, any of these sound of interest to you or not, but we'd like to hear what you would like to say. And at this point, yeah, what uh, we thought you could do is just leave your suggestions on the desk, and what we're going to do is put it up on the website, uh, the different ideas of what to focus on, and we'd like you guys, we'd like you all to go in and register what you th were most interested in, or make additional suggestions on the website. So with that, uh, then. No, I was just going to say thank you, and I noticed someone left a card on the desk that said for 2018 they hoped we'd start our meetings on time. Let me remind you that we didn't get into the building until almost quarter to seven, and we had to set everything up tonight. So we apologize again for the delay. So thank you all very much. And remember, we do want to hear your input, so leave card at the front desk or go to our website and register what you'd like to have us focus on for next year. Thanks again.